Well, I want to be the first, Nathan, to congratulate Taylor Swift's boyfriend on another Super Bowl victory. Go Big Yeti! <laughs> I love that guy! The conspiracies were true. The conspiracies were true. Can you imagine people thinking, like, as if the Super Bowl would give Taylor Swift any more coverage? The Super Bowl needs Taylor, as crazy as that is. Like, she's bigger than the Super Bowl. So Yeah, if it was scripted, I... it was the other way around. It was scripted, <laughs> them hiring Taylor to come be a part of this, not Taylor hiring uh -huh. the the NFL to make her bigger. They might be borrowing money from her at this point. Yeah, exactly. And the only thing that would have made the Super Bowl better, in my opinion, would have been if the halftime show would have been Taylor. So then yeah. everybody would have lost their damn minds, and it would have been great. But all yeah. the hate. Stop the hate. She's nothing but positivity. <laughs> T-Swift. T-Swift. We got to get on it. Get on the T-Swift the bandwagon. Hello and welcome back to Worst Church Ever. I am Chris. And I'm Nathan. And we're two lifelong friends navigating the intersections of the secular and sacred in this space every Monday. And all the days between in the course of our daily lives as husbands, fathers, and followers of Jesus, rejecting fundamentalism and exploring cycles of trauma and healing in the redemptive stories of scripture and in the reflections of the sacred all around us. So grab some baked goods and a cup of coffee because it's time for a discussion at Worst Church Ever. Add your thoughts and comments online and don't forget to subscribe so we can keep the conversation going. So speaking of T-Swift, we're a week late on this because we record this earlier than, uh, than everyone else suspects. Taylor Swift had some wins on the Grammys as well. Did you have a chance to check out any of the Grammy action at all? A little bit. I didn't watch it live, but I got to do that thing where I heard about all the garbage that happened afterward. Like, first of all, Killer Mike got arrested. What? Like, that guy. That's I love that guy. Totally <laughs> random. That's, yeah, I, it's come out since then that he uh, said it was because of an overzealous security guard, which I, I mean, if Killer Mike is saying it, I kind of believe it. You know, like that guy. Is, yeah, that guy's deep. Um, that's why I was of so all the shocked, people like, to they... say that somebody's overzealous. <laughs> that might be the one to believe. Yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so there was that. And then there was, you know, the controversy controversy, as our friends across the, the Atlantic would say that's about right. what Jay-Z had to say. And, you know, so I decided that if, in fact, Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift win the Super Bowl, um, don't give Jay-Z a hot mic. But whatever you think about what he said, obviously there's truth. Parts of it ring true, no doubt. But then you also have to think about like the context and everything else. But I will say that um, Taylor Swift got her 13th Grammy. That's also her lucky number. I don't know if you knew that. I have a Swifty in the house, so I know that. And she said, I know that this would not have been possible without my amazing fans. And that's what you, know, you want to hear because she's totally right. But look, she has found a way to connect to people on a level that is amazing. And most of it is because of kindness and positivity. You know, I mean, yeah, there's the intrigue of like, which, which ex-boyfriend is this song about and all that crap. But like, she as a person is constantly, you know, being good to her fans and, and, and puts positivity out there. And uh, I think that's why she's winning at everything. So good for her. And she does have some pretty good lyrics too. Very smart, very smart songwriter for sure. And, Beyonce looked a little like she wasn't quite sure if she was with what Jay-Z was saying, so I don't know. Well, I think it's true that the Grammys have largely ignored black artists. So that part's true. But when the person telling you that has won like 75,000 of them, it's a little hard to hear. So I, the, you need to be able to see through that and say, like, there's truth to what Jay-Z's saying. It just may not be true for Jay-Z and Beyonce. It's like been a historic struggle to have black art represented. The, the The weird part about it is two things are true. One, it's true that the Grammys and the industry in general has been terrible at recognizing black artists and black contributions. But it's also true that Beyonce has 32 Grammys. And it's also true that Jay-Z is one of the, if not the most powerful person in the recording industry. And Jay-Z is right. Like the Grammys are historically bad at even getting categories right. Like growing up, I remember seeing people in categories where I'm like, why are they in that cat? The Grammy people have been very out of touch. So, but what does that translate to empirically when you're getting an award for art? Because that's a totally subjective thing. 
So how do you quantify the systemic injustices when it's when you're judging art? You know, um, it is tough because it is tough because there are way better artists out there than Beyonce or Taylor Swift. But those two ladies are probably the two biggest artists on the planet, you know. Yeah. So and just because I might prefer a totally different kind of musical art than what they produce doesn't mean that their art isn't as good and doesn't mean that I also love it. But if I'm going to choose one thing to listen to for the rest of my life, it might be something other than that. You know, like, why doesn't Leonard Cohen have all the Grammys? Why doesn't Elliot Smith have all the Grammys? Why doesn't why doesn't Sister Rosetta Tharp have all the Grammys or Mahalia Jackson or or Michael Jackson or Smokey Robinson or Radiohead? No, Radiohead. Yeah, exactly. It's trying to make an objectively true statement based on a subjective process of subjective things. And that's probably why people felt like it was sour grapes when Jay-Z said what he said, even though there's obviously merit and truth and everything to, to what he's saying. So, Well, we did see, which was great, was Tracy Chapman and Luke Combs up there doing fast car which by the way my wife calls it fat ass car instead of fast car because you know, the way she sings it on the original is like you got a fat ass car like it's it sounds like she's saying fat ass car so just a little secret between the two of us it is that is empirically one of my favorite songs and i can measure that because i'm talking about myself yeah yeah no that's one of the greatest songs of all time and her performance of it in 1988 or whatever I think was groundbreaking because you don't expect to hear a black female vocal with that instrumentation. And it's not like, it's not a very easy song to play either. And because no. of the rhythm and everything. And um, I mean, she's so gifted and so talented. And in the late eighties, you were not seeing on in a mainstream setting, a black woman singing acoustic rock songs. And correct. But it's not only that she was black and it was what it was, chord structure wise and instrumentation wise the melody is so so good and so out of left field but do you remember in the late 80s and early 90s there was a lot of music that felt like it would have been apropos to be like on twin peaks it was like that spooky creepy like constant craving by katie lang is another one there's a lot that were really good but they were creepy hers almost went into that but veered out of it because it was a true story and it was from the heart and it was sincere and there was nothing ironically observed about it. It was just about these people trying to make it, which is why when Luke Combs did it, I almost felt a little bit of a letdown because he did it in a very predictable way where it just sounds like a, a country song. So it, it lost something for me, even though he, the story that she tells could very well be the story of somebody in the white working class, you know, and, and he brings that to it. And again, that it gives us a moment to say, guess what? There are a lot of things that unite us um, and our struggles unite us, by the way. So and unfortunately, poverty being one of them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm just happy that she's getting her flowers because, damn, she deserves them. You know? Yeah. You know, so I know we've talked about the Luke Combs version being a little bit derivative. You know, it's, it's really just a cover with some extra instrumentation in it. The one thing I think that it, I loved about his derivativeness is that he didn't even change the gender, right? I'm working on yeah. a, I'm working at a, as a, as a cashier girl, right? Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't even thought about that, but you're right. That is really interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, he, he really truly is looking at this and saying, I'm not just going to sing this song. I am going to honor it in its original structure. Sure. I've got a couple of little things I'm going to do to. Yeah put the oh. the nice pedal steel guitar in the background or whatever but yeah, yeah really honored it I, and when they did the song live they didn't even break out into extra harmonies i mean it, the harmony being just the sure. melody line doubled at a lower octave yeah but there weren't right they weren't breaking out any new territory there and in some cases you would see someone that wants to just jump in there and add an extra their own harmony line or whatever and luke combs is like nope we're gonna do this tracy's way yeah, the ultimate respect, I think. And now her version is number one on Spotify. I don't know if you saw that. I didn't see that yet, but I'm not surprised. Number one is Tracy Chapman, Fast Car. Number 10, the Spotify top 10, is Give Me One Reason by Tracy Chapman. So people were like, oh, I remember her and that other song she did five or six years later. Yeah, so. I'm glad she's finally getting her comeuppance, as we might say. And not that she didn't yeah. have it in the 80s, but it's nice to see an artist right. that you know, had a good run and people are now going back and being re-inspired by it again. 
because I, she didn't yes. have a tremendously long career, right? Then again, like most artists don't sit around recording music for decades anyway. Like you look at the Beatles, they were only around for a few years and then stop. Not everybody's going to be Pink Floyd. Or, or or the Rolling Stones, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or U2, yeah. I guess, would be the, the yeah. modern counterpart to that, which, you know, I think they're starting to fade out of the limelight, but they're still trying to hold on. Yeah. Well, they still make good stuff, in my opinion, but it's harder and harder for people in their 60s to, to captivate the popular imagination in the mainstream. They're one of... They're one of the few left that can do it, you know, I think. Because yeah. at will, they can show up on Fallon or on SNL and be like, we're here, we're, we're doing this. I don't know that we'll ever make it out there, but I saw that they have that, that show in Vegas that they're doing in the Dome, or in that yep. sphere, I guess they call it. The and sphere. it looks like yeah. an incredibly interesting show. I I don't think I'm going to be able to make it out to Vegas to see that, but um, yeah. just the idea and the and the theatrics of it all, right? Just that yep. clearly U2 belongs in that setting if they can <laughs> you know, pull it off because it's just cool. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're the ones to do it, I feel like. I think Coldplay might be able to pull it off, but not now because they're still selling out the biggest arenas in the world. Actually, I think Coldplay have been on tour now for two years and they've not had a show yet that hasn't sold out. They're just slowly making their way around the world. Can I tell you a quick story about, about Coldplay? Yeah. You know uh, Martin Guitar, right? Absolutely. Famous, famously used by, by many, 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 many people. Nazareth, Pennsylvania, by the way, both of us have local roots connected to Nazareth. Absolutely, right here in the in the Lehigh Valley. So the owner of Martin Guitar, it's still a family company. It's in the fifth or sixth generation. His name is Christian Frederick Martin the fifth, something like that. I I don't mean to, to get it wrong. I've met Chris a few times because our kids went to school together. Very nice guy, very gracious, very generous with the school. He gave us free tours of the plant and all kinds of neat neat, neat guy. Um, but he goes by Chris Martin. And of course, he's been Chris Martin longer than the Coldplay guy has been Chris Martin because this guy's yeah. in his 60s, I think. So he had to go over to the UK, the, the Martin guitar, Chris Martin, had to go over to the UK and do a presentation uh, for the recording industry. And all the higher ups told everybody, Chris Martin is coming. And so then all the underlings got really, really excited because I thought it was Chris Martin from Coldplay. So they made these big banners like, welcome Chris Martin and all that other stuff. So then <laughs> he gets there. And Wasn't he, hey, the Chris support. Martin that everyone had expected? I think everybody was probably like, did whatever they could to save face. But I think he found it really funny. So he's a good sense of humor. So yeah, but it's still a great Chris Martin who makes an amazing product. And I'm sure Chris Martin, Coldplay, he probably uses Chris Martin, Martin guitars. So there you go. I don't know if what he uses or not, but I definitely think that Chris Martin playing Chris Martin's guitars would be really cool if it doesn't if it isn't already a thing. That would make be it happen, awesome. Internet. Make it happen. Make it happen. Come on. <laughs> Do you know Ed Sheeran plays a three quarters uh, Martin because he has small hands, and I likewise yeah. have hands that aren't great at cording some of the bar chords and stuff. So I got a three quarter Martin recently. You know what? A little... We should yeah. get one for Donald Trump, too. Because he's apparently got small hands as well. My hands are huge. Very big hands. Oh, good old big hands, they call me. <laughs> it's you a, know, it's it, fake, fake news. I don't, know that, I don't know that his hands are all that small. It's just that he's, that he's over six feet tall. So if you, have, if you ha have hands that are normal size, your hands look like they're small because you are actually quite, quite a tall individual. So I don't know that he has small Absolutely. hands. He just has maybe disproportionate hands exactly exactly normal sized hands on a tall man i'm a tall as well but i have proportionate hands and then sometimes same thing with my feet i have a 13 shoe and so when you see me it's just proportionate but then somebody will stand next to me and they'll be like oh my gosh your feet are massive um <laughs> we'll play like soccer or whatever and, and i'm always stepping on people's feet it's not because i'm trying to but it's it's just like when i run it's, it covers half the field you know how how tall are you nathan I'm almost six four, or maybe six four. I don't know. It's it's right on the cusp. It depends that's on good, how high my good. hair is that day. <laughs> Your hair, yeah. So I'm <laughs> about five eight, and my friend John is six eight, a real a actual six eight. So he's an actual foot taller than me. So I will always text him and be like, "Hey, we should start a band," and it's only ever based on names that I think will be funny, based oh. on what's going on in our life at any given time. So the genre of the band also changes based on what name I can think of that'll make me laugh. 
So my, one time I told them we should make a, a folk duo like Simon and Garfunkel, but call it the long and the short of it. Because there's a foot between us. So I don't know how that didn't happen, but yeah. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great I, idea. I, I'd i be the Simon in that uh, scenario, height wise. He'd be the Simon in terms of uh, musical ability. No offense to our Garfunkel, voice of an angel, but you know, Paul was the the driving uh, musical force, I think. Yeah. <laughs> There's this comedy duo, Garfunkel and... Yes. She, Oates? Kate Micucci, she's from Nazareth, PA as well. She also was the, was Gooch on Scrubs. She was Ted's girlfriend on Scrubs. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. They, yep. That's another yep. duo that could have been the long and the short of it because they're, they're not the same height, clearly. When you film them, you got to get a really wide lens camera to get them both in the frame. So that you'd have That's to right. get some advice on if you ever do a duo with John, you can just be like, yeah. you know, talk to them and be like, how'd you get on the camera at the same time without looking like totally disproportionate? <laughs> <laughs> I have something that I wanted to talk with you about, and that is uh, neuroscience. We talk a lot about stories on this particular podcast, Worst Church Ever. So we've talked about stories in the Old Testament, and we talk about stories like just our family. And sometimes we tell stories about Chris Martin and Martin Guitars and all that sort of stuff. And one of the things that I've been learning about storytelling is that it actually changes your brain when you hear stories. So they did a study and they actually had somebody t inside of this machine like reading a story and they were like looking at the brain activity. And then they had some other folks that did the same, um, the same test, but instead of reading the story, they listened to that person reading the story. So they recorded it and then played it back. And what was interesting is when that person that was reading the story and the person listening to the story, even though they weren't doing it at the same time, their brain wave and their brain activity started to synchronize. And you could actually see that their brain activity started to mirror each other. And when you think about why storytelling is so powerful, why like scriptures are full of stories is because when you have audiences that need to remember things and need to hear things, telling stories is a great way to do it because you really get on the same page. In real biological sense, when you're telling me a story about Chris Martin or Martin Guitars, my brain is actually activated and we are thinking the same way. How cool is that? That's phenomenal. <laughs> and it brings us back to the power of Viktor Frankl, somebody that your wife is very familiar with, his work in, in logotherapy, which is the use of story and of personal story to actually heal. It's amazing to think about. And isn't it interesting that in Christianity, we have this idea of the, of the logos or the logos God who is the word um, incarnate. And then, of course, like you say, Nathan, the primacy of story in our tradition. And wouldn't it be interesting if we could get everybody to sort of stop worrying about is something literally true in the Bible uh, and instead focus on how is this story giving me life as I read it right here and right now? What is this story doing to my brain mm -hmm. and the blessing that comes from that? And, you know, Nathan, I would not be surprised if in the end we figure out that the spiritual and the physical, there's no separation, that we're all physical and all spiritual all the time. And that our minds really do sync up in ways that resemble quantum entanglement and all these other synchronicities and telemetries that connect us in ways far beyond anything that empirical science has yet been able to show us. I, I think there's a lot to that. I think it also is one of the reasons why Jesus talks in parables, stories. Yeah. It's why most sacred scriptures are filled with stories over facts. There are facts in there. There's genealogies and, you know, they went to this place or that place and there were this many people or whatever. And, you know, so there is that stuff in there, but mostly it's story. These are the things that happen to people, right? And I yeah. think that that's one of the reasons why we have that is because no matter like who you are and what era you live, you can see the truth in that and you can hear the humanity in that. And so I, you know, I think one of the other things that we need to ask ourselves is, you know, we're telling stories on this podcast, but are you listening to stories as well? Right. So yeah. if I want Chris to be on the same wavelength as me, one thing I could do is I could tell him a story. Right. And then he's, Assuming it's an interesting story, the two of us start to sync up. But I could also ask him to tell me a story. And in the same process, his brain and mine are starting to enmesh with each other. And I'm starting to see the commonalities. I'm starting to hear things. So, you know, whether or not you're listening to a story or telling a story, 
that same thing is happening. And so I, I just had kind of a thought is like, sometimes when we find people we disagree with, ask them to tell you stories. Yeah. Your that, capacity for empathy will skyrocket. Yeah. You know, and so will theirs. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And that's the most important thing is empathy, really, because we're all in each other's shoes, even when we're not. I mean, there are some commonalities that we all share. Um, and fear is one of those. And grief is one of those. Mourning, all those very human, basic, universal things. Um, and even though we might be from different places and have different um, predilections or preferences or whatever, there are some very basic human mechanisms of emotion and response that I think we can empathize better with if, like you say, Nathan, we just listen to each other's stories. I think that's really important. I think that's really profound. Uh, I'll give you an example of that. Uh, back in 2008, 2009, 2010, President Obama was the uh, president in the White House. I was not particularly interested in his politics or in him as a as an individual. I didn't vote for him personally. And I don't know that I necessarily disliked him. I, I just kind of was, yeah, didn't really care one way or the yeah. other. I didn't vote for the other side either. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, fast forward a few years and we were going to a church and there had been a tragedy that had occurred in that church where the pastor there, one of his grandkids had a, a terrific brain injury and I, I, I think it was cancer and, and had passed away and it was devastating. And I remember reading later on that this pastor had actually gotten a call from President Obama who had known him because this pastor was on the uh, spiritual advisor board for the president. So I'm reading this story about President Obama calling my pastor at this point in time and not not doing anything other than saying, I want to pray for you right now. And I just want to minister to you for a little bit. So here's the president of the, <laughs> of the United States, you know, leader of the free world, has lots of other stuff to worry about. He's calling a pastor in Orlando and just saying, hey, I want to spend a little bit of time praying for you because I know this is hard and I know that you need to be ministered to in this moment and it completely changed everything I thought about Obama in that moment. Yeah. Yeah. Suddenly he went from being just a president to being someone who was personally involved with somebody I cared about. Uh, it changes everything. That's a beautiful story. So, you know, I, it's to know the people that you don't agree with especially the people you don't agree with. And you might find that you actually do agree. Do you remember that skit from, I don't know, the la maybe the 2016 election cycle where it was Tom Hanks and it was Black Jeopardy on SNL. They have 99% things in common, the people on, you know, two African-American contestants and then Tom Hanks as a total country guy. And they all, they, they, they have all the same, I don't want to say all the same, but you understand what I mean. Like, a lot of the same yeah. issues. I actually think in political horseshoe theory, where the people on the left and the right at the end of the horseshoe are more similar than the people that are less extreme, I think that a lot of people that voted for Trump could have also just as easily been Bernie Sanders voters because of the sort of po the populism appeal and the intuitive <laughs> conviction that the system is rigged and something big is out to screw them. So I guess if you think it's the government trying to screw you, you voted for Trump. If you think it's corporate America trying to screw you, you voted for Bernie. But I also know that a lot of people who voted for Trump also believe that corporations are trying to screw everybody too. It's just on the hierarchy of um, fear, which one do you fear more, I guess. But yeah, very similar, you know. So there's way more that we have in common. I, I saw a quote from someone, and this is probably a little over the top, but I think it kind of embodies what you're saying. And I think I saw him go from a Bernie supporter to a Trump supporter, which was just so completely surprising. Like in the primaries, he was all about Bernie and then suddenly went to Trump. And I was like, what in the world is going on? And yeah. he said, I don't care as long as we burn the whole thing down. Right. Right. And that, yeah. that was like, okay. All right. Some of these voters, they're just looking for someone who's going to stand up and say, enough is enough. I don't care if we go left <laughs> or right, but we got to move out of whatever we got right now. And that's a terrifying place to be in as a country when there's ambivalence, but the only thing that people are not ambivalent toward is the fact that the current thing is terrible. That's how January 6th happens. Other reasons too, but that's a big part of it. Yeah, it totally is. I've, I, and I've seen that same thing happen countless times where you see people that 
get caught up in something and then their beliefs shift, but their enthusiasm doesn't. And yeah. so yeah. they just kind of get carried from one thing to another. And by the way, I'm not immune to that either. Right. I'm carried around by my beliefs as well. So this isn't like throwing stones at anybody because you know, I can, I yeah. can be fickle. <laughs> well, it's interesting because one of the places that I find that to be frustrating is people who, and I'm going to talk now about Christians because we're the worst church ever. People who came out of fundamentalism or hard right evangelicalism, but are still Christians. And now they're, let's say, far more progressive to use that label. But the the, the vehemence and the close-mindedness and the judgmentalism from when they were over here on the right has not changed. It's just... Yeah. It's, it's all that same, those same tactics and the dehumanizing statements and the, the absolutism that used to be in the service of fascism is now in the service of some other kind of fascism, which is not to conflate progressive and conservative because the differences are important. But how do you act? How do you act? How do you, what do you post on Facebook? Because if in the name of Jesus, as a progressive Christian, you're writing terrible, horrible things about people who are made in the image of God who disagree with you, well, how far have you really come? Not very far. Absolutely. We have to, we just have to get away from that. And it's so easy to go from one to the other extreme and not really have grown in the process, I guess. You can see that happening in like larger narratives. And this is Christianity. This is political as well, where you have people that are trying to label another belief system as less than a human. Oh, yeah. When you take your beliefs and you basically say that anyone that believes anything different is less than human or, or it maybe not less than human, but less than Christian, like a gatekeeping. Yeah. Like I, I heard some people on threads the other day and they were talking about how upset they were with some people that were gatekeeping them saying, if you evaluated where you stand and then you've moved on to something else, then you never were a Christian to begin with. And they were really offended by this, saying, no, it wasn't that I didn't believe. It was like, I believe very profoundly, and then things changed. And so you're telling me what my experience was, and you're saying it wasn't legitimate. And I think that's yeah. frustrating to a lot of people when you're saying, like, you know, you never, like, if you think you experienced that, then you you didn't. Because no yeah. one that had a truly life-changing experience would ever walk away from this. Um, but I think that <laughs> we say those things on the other side of it. For yeah. a number of reasons, one is we just want to have that idea of who's in and who's out. But I think the other part of it might be something internally. Like, if you know, if you could walk away from this, I'm scared that I could too. Yeah, and I'm scared that God could let me or God could let you, which means that one of the five tenets of Calvinism, the perseverance of the saints, is not true. And to people who are very, very conservative, a lot of them consider themselves to be Calvinists, even though they're really not. But that's the the, uh, the pop theology description of people like Mark Driscoll and, and others, um, you know, neo Calvinist, hardcore Calvinists. And you have to believe in double predestination, and you have to believe that once you are a believer, you can never stop being one. So if you do walk away, well, clearly you weren't of the elect anyway. So there's theological gymnastics happening in addition to the emotional and the psychological ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go back to this thing of. Imagine the most powerful being in the universe being that petty that like, like you, not only do you have to be a Christian, but you also have to be a five point Calvinist of this particular confession. You know what I mean? Like it's, it's kind of nuts. And look, I want people to follow Jesus. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that that's not important. I'm just saying if you will let yourself think out in bigger and bigger circles, What's more important to you, that God's omnipotent or that God is limited by the fact that he has to apparently follow a bunch of rules that he is at his own free discretion to not follow? I, I don't know. It's Yeah. It, yeah. I'm going to throw this out there and maybe you can edit or revise this or, or maybe agree with it. I don't know. But I, yeah, I wonder if some of it may just be maturity level as well. And I'm, I'm not saying maturity level like that the people are immature, but I'm saying like where right. you are in where your journey is. I'll put it into a parent child relationship, right? So I'm, I'm a child, I'm growing up under the purview of my parents and I do something wrong and there's a sense of shame there for whatever reason. And I, I wonder if I'm deserving of my parents' love or not. And just this, this feeling of like, well, I'm horrible. Like I don't deserve to be your kid or whatever. I don't deserve to have love, but 
think then as you get older, there's this other thing that happens because you now have kids and they do something and you're, you're annoyed by it and you're not happy. It does. I don't always like my kids, but there's never a moment where I don't love them. Right. If this is the person that's the adult in the relationship, they don't expect the person that's the child in the relationship to get it right all the time. Or if they do, mm. that's not a very good parent. Right. 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 That's a really good way to put it. It reminds me of something I was reading about confession also, which is a reminder. It was, I think it was actually in a prayer of confession that somebody had written and was posted online. And it was basically getting at the idea that <laughs> we don't confess because we think we need to remind God of all the things we've done that are worthy of punishment. We confess because it's the first step on the path to transformation. And all the great 12-step programs know this. The first thing you have to do is admit you have a problem. And when I think about the lit in liturgy for church, if there's a prayer of confession, you're not going to surprise God. It's not like you're going to go to confession and be like, ah, guess what, God? I did this. God already knows. Uh, and God already sees who you are having gone through that uh, and who you can be going through that. And it's really about admitting it to yourself and feeling the support of community and feeling a reminder that you're forgiven. And because of those things, you can hear a story of redemption and salvation and your brain can rewire and you can grow and you can do better next time. And you can be on a path toward greater health and wholeness and healing. Yeah. Yeah. This isn't the, this isn't a vengeful parent that's just going to hold it over your head, right? Yeah. If you don't make an accurate account of every bad thing you ever did, I'm not going to love you and forgive you. But that's how we live. And if you're a person like me who lives with OCD anxiety disorder, you can make your frailties into your idols. And you can think, because my brain wants to make account for everything I did wrong, that must be how God is. And I think about how self-centered and arrogant that is. But when you have sort of disordered thinking, that's what happens. For and sure. we spiritualize it. And, and we're still not experts as human beings at understanding all the mental health issues that are out there and making sure that we destigmatize the need for help and everything else. So it's like, you know, I think a lot of times in the past, people who had the, the, these disordered ways of thinking got into positions of authority and power. And a lot of them made up a lot of rules <laughs> that were probably meant to just still their own mind. Some of those things are the aggregate wisdom of thousands of years, and maybe we shouldn't just ignore them. Like, you know, people have been trying to do the human thing for 100,000 years. So for me, the balance is, where do you see it bringing life to people? Where do you see it mirroring Jesus? Where do you see it inviting you into healing and wholeness? So I think Jesus provides a lens for us with which to view these things. But you can't get that lens just by reading scripture. You have to be encountering Christ in your spirit and in the world because the most important thing the scripture says is that he is risen and that he is with us and that he's interacting with us in real time, not just through this religious artifact. So, And for those that would hear that and say sola scriptura or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah. I would argue, and I'm sure you would too, Chris, wow. that we live in this very profound time on earth when we actually have access that I can pick up a Bible and read it. Most people don't have that luxury if you look back across time. And it's the only way you're right. going to do it is by hearing it and stories and then seeing it lived out in the community. So it's not to say that the scripture isn't important, but what we're saying is the scripture and the relationships around you are where you're going to see it happen and lived out every day. And so just pouring over your notes every week and not actually pouring into the people around you is a very, very shallow way to understand anything. Yeah, that's really good. You have to, in that pouring imagery, you have to let God be pouring into you. And you can't be like, yeah. you can't hold your Bible over your head like an umbrella to repel the fact that God wants to pour into you so much that you might actually abandon a lot of your fear-based false beliefs and, and idolatry. Uh, and open up to the fact that God wants to wash you in more and more and more avenues and, and experiences of grace Great. that you can then share with others and be gracious toward others and also then be full of gratitude, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like the love of God is too good to be true because my definition, of, my understanding of the Bible puts a, puts limits around it. So I'm going to yeah. adhere to those limits rather than to what I hear the voice of God speaking. 
And I think Jesus ran into that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot. I think, I think he had this common phrase he used to use called you brood of vipers for pe people that did <laughs> ran in those circles. Right. You didn't have a lot of tolerance for that. Right. By the way, that's not about anything ethnic or religious group. It's not because the Pharisees were Jewish that he said that. So sorry, Christian nationalists. That's not what this is about. It's about here you are giving the opportunity to interact with God in your very presence, but yet you'd prefer to cling to the religion that gives you power, whether you're an Israelite or a Roman or an American or a Palestinian. When I use scripture as a weapon to hold <laughs> power over someone else or to dictate who is in, who is out, whatever that looks like, that's not good. No, right, and that's... that's not how Jesus used scripture. Right. In fact, Jesus says, when in doubt between what scripture says and the overwhelming possibilities of the overwhelming love of God, go with the latter, not the former. That's what he means when he says, you have heard it said this, but I say to you that. It's like when the I say to you that is more gracious, it's because God's actually more gracious than we can imagine and that we can relate through a religious artifact, whether it's a scripture or statue or, or an idol, certainly, or a cathedral, right? Or a systematic theology. That's all too confining. And that those are all only parts of this ongoing narrative, this ongoing story that God continues to whisper to our hearts and sometimes shouts at us. Yeah. I want to speak to the other side of it, though, because I think we've spent some time talking to the people that would say sola scriptura. But I also want to say like something to those that have maybe moved beyond that who say, well, I'm not going to bother reading it at all. Right. And I don't think that's fair either. The beauty of these stories and these books and these poems and these sayings that we have is such that you should want to come back to them, just like you come back to your favorite book. Last week, we were, I was talking about going back to Watership Down and revisiting it and reading it again. It's not like I finished it and I'm done. I go back and there's something there for me again. And so anybody that's on either side of that issue is going to get it wrong if they're either looking at it going like, I'm only going to read scripture or I'm never going to read scripture. It's not, it shouldn't be an either or. I think the Bible uniquely, okay, look at other religious texts and this is not to crap on other texts, but the I Ching was written in China by Chinese people from two different dynasties, not in two different eras. There's the the main part, and then there's the, the the secondary part, which comes later, which kind of spiritualizes the first part. But point being, it's rather monolithic. Maybe it's two smaller monoliths put into one. A Greek mythology was written by people in the Greek Isles and in and in, in the Mediterranean. The Quran, according to the tradition of Muslims, dictated to one person in one language in one city. Joseph Smith, Book of Mormon, same kind of deal. Um, you can go on and on with any any religion that uh, uses text. Now I understand that the ancient Greeks didn't like have written texts, but you get what I'm saying. But the Bible, to me at least, uniquely deals with people f over a course of thousands of years from dozens of cultures and even different languages, different political realities. And it also captures the emergence of the modern world because of the Roman Empire. Uh, we get this, this actual touchstone to real history. I think that's incredibly unique and I think that's incredibly valuable. All of those things. Genesis cannot anticipate revelation in terms of people bringing it together canonically. Okay, If you want to believe that, yes, you know, Genesis points to Revelation because God has orchestrated it to do that. That I have no problem with people thinking that. It's not a bad way to think theologically, but it is a bad way to think theologically if you believe that the Bible itself somehow gives itself Bible status, because it does not, um, which makes, makes Christianity sometimes guilty of, I have to believe blah, 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 blah about the Bible, which all those blah, blah, blahs aren't actually from the Bible, <laughs> about the Bible before I can believe in Jesus, right? That's why the living Christ is so important. But anyway, if the Bible is sacred, which I think it is, part of the reason why it is, is because it's far more diverse than 
your lived experience in 2024 or my lived experience in 2024. You know, we pat ourselves on the back because we go to equity trainings and we, you know, we live in a world where we can hop on Facebook and talk to people in Nigeria if we want. But, but the Bible itself is a is a rich, rich expression of far more uh, diverse settings, ideas, attitudes, uh, everything than than the normal American has in the course of their day, let alone their life. So. I think that's interesting that of all the religious texts out there, the Bible, I think he's unique in that way. Um, yeah, as you're saying that, it's kind of an interesting thought that I've got this <laughs> anthology, we'll call it. Good word, yeah. Uh, of of different poems and stories and accounts. Like, I, there's lots of different things in there because you've got different perspectives. We've got Yep. You know, letters that are written to individuals, which is, I don't yeah. know if whoever was writing some of these letters that are attributed to Paul, all of them expected them to be shared with everyone else. Like I wrote this letter to Chris. <laughs> That's it. Uh, yeah. I don't know if I That's really. That's like when you accidentally, you accidentally like respond to all, but you only meant to respond to like that one guy in Corinth who was pissing you off. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Again, again, I, later on, what you have is you have a bunch of people that come and they look through these different writings and they editorialize them and they put them together. They curate them, I guess is maybe the best word, and say that there's this common theme and there's this idea that's running through there that has harmony and um, et cetera. But it is, yeah, it's, it's kind of cool. I feel the same way about um, hymns. Uh, there's a lot of different modern hymns that are out there that are, you know, terrific. But I really like going back and singing some of the old songs. And if nothing else, it's just it's kind of cool to be able to think about the fact that I'm singing the same song that somebody a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago, or in some cases a thousand years ago, was singing it. Maybe they were singing it with slightly different words, and maybe the tune has gotten adjusted over time. But like, there's this beautiful thing that happens when you've got something old like that, where it's it's just cool that the same thing that impacted someone in ancient Rome or in ancient Jerusalem is still alive and singing its words to me here in Maine. That's really <laughs> cool. And That's, there's something yeah, epic right. to see something that has that kind of profound reach across time and, and across different people groups. So I love it. I got a chance to go to Ireland and got a chance to look at the, the Book of Kells, which is one of the oldest manuscripts of the New Testament in in Europe, at least. Um, and it's an Irish document, and it's beautifully made from a thousand years ago. But because it's written in Latin, I could read enough of it to know that I was looking at the prologue, the very first verses of the Gospel of John. And to read that in Latin, written a thousand years ago in the Irish Isles, and I'm reading it now as a tourist from America who, doesn't know much Latin, but knows enough to be able to read it. In the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. Um, that was an incredibly profound experience too, you know, all, along similar lines. There's sometimes when you see something that's has this weight of time, timelessness. Is that the right word? Yeah. Yeah. It's like very it, it, time constrained, but at the same time, it's very timeless because it's like, it's transcended time. And so it's, yes, in some ways it's very ancient and yet in some ways it's very now. And I think that's, yeah. that's what you're saying is like, you just have those moments. That's just, it's like, whoa. And I think that's probably what eternity is like, you know, what heaven is like, um, is that collapsing yeah. that all at once, you know, ness, I guess you could say that sacred, sacred time. Yeah. Hey, so, yeah. um, before, before we wrap up today, I see you've got a shirt on that, I am really enjoying. Thank you. I want to know more because we're actually on a rewatch of Shit's Creek right now, and I'm just really loving it. <laughs> so we, you and I, have this, today is actually what Friday. We had started this on was it Monday that we started this? Yeah, here we tried. Um, we tried on Monday and it just didn't work. Yeah, and we had some stuff happen, and I was wearing a dark black T-shirt and this sweater, so I thought, oh, I will put that on today, so I can through wizardry. It looks like whatever. But I grabbed the shirt and I grabbed the sweater and I grabbed the shirt out, out of the dryer and it was inside out. And I thought it was my plain black tee. But when I put it on, it was my wife's <laughs> Rose Apocathery t-shirt, which on her is very fetching 
on me, it's an accidental belly shirt. But I figured, you know what? You're only going to see me from here up. I've got the, I've got the sweater, so I'm in good shape, and I can represent for David Rose because Schitt's Creek is one of the best shows ever made. Empathy just wells up in me when I watch it and watching these people struggle and change and actually grow and actually become good people. It's actually what the gospel is supposed to do for people. <laughs> and get out of God's way. Let the healing happen. And that's what I see happen on shows like Schitt's Creek and Ted Lasso. So I'll represent David Rose. I like that you said that, Chris, because that is one of the things that I love about that show as well, is that you see this family of completely self-absorbed people that cannot get out of their own way. Yeah. And yeah. to see them go from that to a place of an empathy and understanding uh, was really great. But I think it actually ties into what we've been talking about today. They're in a small town. They're this rich, affluent family that's taken us tumble down to the lower ranks of society and they feel very elite and they feel like they don't belong until what? Until they start talking to people. Yes. Yeah. And once they start building relationships hope... with others, I think it profoundly helps them actually understand themselves. Like, I don't think that this family ever had relationships with anybody before. Like, I, I, I think that's part of what this show no. is trying to say is, like, this is a family who had all these connections, but they didn't have any relationships. Oh, that is well said. Yes. I totally yeah. agree. And as that happens, you see healing take place in what? every single one of the characters. And even the even the side characters that live in the town are changed by them for the better, right? But like each one of those characters Absolutely. goes from completely self-absorbed to being connected in a community. And I don't know if all of them came out in the place where we'd want to be best friends with any of them, or, or all of them at least, but all of them made yeah, tremendous yeah, yeah. character growth as, as a result of their experience in that town. Yep. David and Stevie are a good example of people who had to let their own guard down a little bit so that they could empathize with each other. And then <laughs> they get lifelong friendship and they both heal through that. Yeah. Schitt's Creek actually makes Johnny and Moira into good parents for the first time ever. The first couple <laughs> episodes can be a little much, but then once you realize where it's going, it's like, yeah, I'm, I'm down with this. I'm in front of the ride. The end is worth the discomfort of the first episodes, right? Yeah. You, uh, you have to establish yeah. characters for a little bit before you can start to mess with them. I think one of the reasons we're addicted to television, we as a society, it's not just because we're lazy and stuff like that. And it's not just because we want to lobotomize, but we actually, we want to feel real things. And so unfortunately, sometimes we feel like the best place to find the real is in these fictional stories. And that's the beauty of fictional stories is that they are real for us. But if the only way you connect is through fictional stories, then you find yourself in a situation like we talked about last week where you're really going to struggle. So make sure you have those real flesh and blood connections too, and not just the parasocial relationships that you might have with your favorite characters on TV, you know? Yeah, that's well said. <laughs> Speaking of which, something that's been bringing me a lot of joy lately, and that is just being able to reconnect with you through this. This has been a really good avenue of being able to reconnect with you and spend time with you. And so I just got to say, like, the joy that I get from our friendship is terrific. And I'm just so thankful for you. Yeah, it goes back to that thing about needing connections. You know, real quick before we go, I saw somebody commented on one of our shorts about the need for connections, about how men are not honest about their feelings and they don't reach out when they need help. And one of the things that has been a real blessing to me is knowing that um, I can reach out to you and tell you anything. And Absolutely. You would, you wouldn't judge. You would hear. You would listen, and you would give me good things to think about, and and you would empathize, and you would let me tell my story, and yeah. you would, you know, meet, meet me where I am. So thank you. And that's, I'll tell you, that's important because a lot of times when you do put yourself out there and people don't respond, you just your heart gets that much harder, and you think it really is me against the world as a yeah. man in this in this life, and that doesn't have to be that. So thank you. You're welcome. It's my pleasure. My pleasure.